My name is Kristen Beebe, and I'm a physician assistant at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Mayo Clinic, Arizona. And I'm happy uh, to introduce Dr. Katz. Um, I will be the moderator um, this morning, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing from our guest speaker about this very important topic. A little bit of background about myself. Uh, I am a clinical psychologist. I co-direct the HOPE program, which is an umbrella for all the psychosocial support services that we provide at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And I have been involved in this field for 30 plus years. I just use the plus because it gets too scary when the numbers get too big. But I have been very connected to children and families going through cancer, bone marrow transplant, and the whole process as a clinician, as a researcher, and developing programs. And so it really is my um, my honor, really, to be interacting with you guys and learning from you and hopefully sharing some of the things that I know. Um, just an overview of the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about um, BMT as a potentially traumatic life experience, uh, understanding individual responses of patients and parents, taking your stress pulse, how to understand how you're doing with this whole process, wherever you might be throughout the process, enhancing coping adjustment and quality of life, we're going to talk about things that can be done to make a difference, finding benefits in a time of challenge, and we'll talk about that, and then, of course, leave time for discussion and answers. Um, where I come from is really reflected by this Larson cartoon. Uh, we don't want a hollow victory, all right? So you see in the, in the photo, in the cartoon, that uh, these two ships were having this tremendous sea battle, and uh, somebody is really excited because he's saying, we've won, we've won, but at what price did this victory take place? And of course, you know, being victorious doesn't always mean that it's a good outcome, and we want to create good outcomes. We do not want this to happen. High-tech medicine has enabled all kinds of amazing things to happen, like the extension of life and the cures of diseases that when I started in my personal lifetime, uh, these diseases were not treatable. Now they are, and they're curable. But we do have to be sensitive to the cost. And I just show you this picture of, of survivors, and many of these young people did go through BMT. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of all the different ages and stages that we are working with when we talk about pediatrics. And it's one of the things that makes it so dynamic and exciting for me and for other of us that that love working in pediatrics because we work through child development. And so we also have to take that into account and parental development. And that was a theme of uh, the previous talk about, you know, the age of parents and the experience of parents as they go through this with their children. So we'll talk about these things. Let's understand a little bit about the BMT experience, the emotional impact this has on patients, parents, caregivers, and families. And so we have these different stages that families go through and the children go through, of course. Um, what was life like pre-BMT? Uh, depending on the child's age, the family may have been very well experienced in going through life in a very calm way. Um, the reality is at my hospital, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, um, where about 70% of the families we treat are Latino, the vast majority of those families are immigrant families. Uh, with low socioeconomic resources. So even before their child was diagnosed and needed to have a BMT, many of the families we're working with are having significant life challenges. Uh, but then once the, the, the procedure takes place, it, going through BMT is traumatic and difficult. Uh, and of course, every hospital is trying their best to minimize those difficulties, and yet we know that it's still a challenge. Once the BMT is finished, we have that early post period where kids and families are coming back to the hospital a lot for follow-up care. And as time goes on, things get a little bit more stable. We move towards long-term survivorship. And uh, there really is a trajectory that our families are going through in our kids and families. Uh, some people get through the, the BMT period very smoothly and then have difficulties and challenges later. And some families have a lot of difficulties and challenges getting through the experience, but once it's done, they do pretty well. So it really is hard to talk about the entire group of people because individual differences are so strong. 
Um, risk and resilience, okay? So this is a really important concept that we're using in child psychology at this point in time, really trying to understand what are some of the factors that put children and their parents and families at greater risk, whereas other families have a lot of resilience. They can bounce back. And uh, we're really looking and trying to come up with profiles. And we do, have, we do know a lot of things. Uh, we know that uh, for the child-patient issues, um, you know, what were their medical experiences like, past and present? So if a child had a very difficult course, uh, and many children come, by the time they come to bone marrow transplant, they have been through a lot already. So they may have suffered, quite literally, um, through different treatment protocols, very aggressive types of treatments, and then they come to, to bone marrow transplant. Um, where again, other, I mean, and on the other side of that, there are some children who have not had a lot of aggressive treatment, but they're getting started with bone marrow transplant because that's the treatment that's identified early on as being best for this child. So the kinds of experiences the child has had in the past can be informative to help us understand what we need to do to try to help them get through this. Uh, what their developmental stage independence and their challenges. So we think about the child's ability to manage life demands independently. Now, of course, every child, and I'm a parent and now a grandparent, and so um, you know, I really do value the role that parents and grandparents, extended family members, play in the raising of a child. And some of us, you know, even without illness being there at all, um, it can be challenging to allow children to develop their independence and, and move forward in their lives. And some parents hold on very tightly, even without there being an illness. So it's important for us to understand what some of those dynamics were like. Um, and sometimes we might say that the illness is responsible for difficulties that a child or family may be experiencing. But sometimes just you know, family systems or the way things kind of like are in the background can also be challenging. So you have one thing added to another. Uh, we want to understand school peers, dating, job, workplace. I know we're talking, I mean, again, the pediatric age range. Let me just ask, um, how many people are here because of, of a child that's like 10 years of age and younger? Okay, how about teenage years? Okay, or older teenage, young adults? Okay, so we got teenagers and younger children, but that's already you know, quite a span of the different kinds of challenges or things kids are going through. Uh, but uh, we really want to understand what are the demands on the child and how we can help them. Ongoing medical surveillance, treatment, rehab, you know, what are the needs? How often does the child need to come in? How disruptive are these medical follow-up visits? How disruptive is it if the child is having some ongoing medical difficulties because of their transplant and that needs to be managed, like graft-versus-host disease or some variant of that? So if things are easier, then we would expect that it might be a little bit easier for the child to kind of like just get on with their regular life. Um, and if it's more complex because there's still a lot of other variables going on, then, then things may need a little bit more of assistance. We want to understand the family and the personal support that's available to the child, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Parent and caregiver issues. So really, so we talked about you know, some of the issues identifying, identified with the child, and now let's talk about the caregiver. That's where you know, this session is focused. Uh, and what is your own personal trauma history? So if you're caring for somebody, a child, who has uh, gone through a very difficult medical experience and still has medical needs uh, and uh, still needs some extra surveillance and extra help, your own personal experiences, even though they may be very different, they don't have anything that they might not have anything to do with the medical experience. For example, a parent who has uh, emigrated to this country and has had great difficulty in that process. Now having a child with a going through this health care crisis, that may bring back into focus some of those earlier traumatic experiences. Um, many of our parents do have their own medical issues, and then it becomes hard to separate out what are my concerns as a parent, because, you know, my gosh, when it happened to me or when something similar or something like this happened, this is how I dealt with it. And so we might then project on the child that, well, I know how difficult it is going to be for my child to deal with this. And that's where sometimes we, we need to help people understand that 
you know, children do respond differently than we do as adults. So we need to be careful about those processes, respectful of everybody uh, and respectful of parents going through the kinds of issues that they're going through. A look at the current personal challenges that a parent might be going through or caregiver uh, separate from the child's illness. And maybe sometimes it, they're interactive as well, like finances. Okay, so that somebody who's lost their job uh, and has a child with special health care needs uh, is going to be extra stressed because not only are they having difficulty being able to meet the needs of the family, but now the child and maybe the medical insurance, they may have gone along with the job. So all of these things can be additive and can add to a person's experience of stress. Uh, primary support. So if we talk about a spouse or a significant other, um, sometimes you know, couples are on the same page and sometimes they're not. Sometimes we have different styles, we have different ways of coping and of adjusting with things. And then it's about learning and figuring out how we can do this together. Uh, the progress of the child post-transplant is something that, of course, every parent is focused on very carefully. Uh, and even though other people around you might be, you know, thinking that, well, it's over now, right? Your child is fine, so just, you know, don't worry about it. Well, that's not really something that most parents are able to do, nor do they need to or want to do that because you've been so involved and your child still needs your help. Um, in everything we're talking about, um, you know, cure is not enough. So the idea of like, you know, doing the medical thing and getting to that point where we've taken care of it. And Kevin Offinger has really, as a, uh, a physician who works in survivorship, and uh, identifying the, the cancer experience is a process that extends throughout a lifetime, a looking glass through which all future health and illness behaviors of the survivor must be interpreted. So once you've gone through some kind of a key life experience, like the serious illness of a child, your child, everything you experience in life will be colored by that to some degree. And it becomes a challenge of how to manage it. Let's talk a little bit about stress. So we all experience stress. Stress is a normal part of life. Um, but there are different kinds of stress. So if you think about, you know, the average kind of stress, like the stress of uh, going in for a, a review at work or something where you get a little bit nervous, like, you know, okay, did I meet all the criteria? So there's kind of like an alarm. And then, you know, our stress level goes up because, like, okay, I'm going to be in that appointment or I'm going to be evaluated for something and I hope it turns out right. And your heart might start beating fast or your blood pressure might start to rise or you just might start to feel yourself perspiring. So these are all ways that our body deals with acute stress. And then the event happens and hopefully your review goes okay or whatever the situation, the, you know, the the near accident that almost happened on the freeway, you know, was averted and, you know, there's that initial shock reaction, but then you begin to calm down and you can go back to a normal, more relaxed type of state. In chronic stress, we're having this up and down kind of an experience where your body is just continually going off. And any parent or caregiver of a child going through serious life experience, like a bone marrow transplant, is going to be experiencing chronic stress. Uh, and there are periods where it gets a little bit quieter, and then there are periods where it kind of like comes back up. And again, well-meaning people may think that, you know, they don't see or they don't know everything that you're going through. Um, so it's a question of how do we manage chronic stress. And now we're talking about traumatic stress. So again, a little bit different. Um, and uh, pediatric medical traumatic stress. So we're kind of like defining things as we, as we move along and become more sophisticated. A uh, set of psychological and physiological responses of children and their families to pain, injury, serious illness, medical procedure, invasive or frightening treatment experiences. So we talk about trauma as kind of like another level of chronic stress where this really gets inside of us in very significant ways. Uh, and we need to understand like what happens when we're experiencing a traumatic kind of an experience. If you think about post-traumatic stress disorder, you hear about uh, war veterans coming home and having difficulties kind of like readjusting to civilian life. Well, you know what? You as families, 
with a child that have gone through battlefield experiences. They're, they're very similar um, because so many things are out of our control when we have a seriously ill child and then we need caregivers and then different kinds of things and they, you know, are doctors and nurses who we have complete trust in, they, always, they can't always predict every eventuality. So sometimes they tell us one thing and then something else happens. So we lose trust in them. Yes, we do, but we still need them and they're really trying to do their best. So these kinds of things are similar to like what happens on a battlefield where people are uncertain about, you know, am I going to survive from one minute to the next? They see people around them having really difficult experiences, as you do as a family member in a hospital. Because some of the children that you, your child has been in the hospital with have not done well, have, have died. And so that puts all of us on edge. And when we're talking about trauma, so the response to a traumatic experience is determined by our interpretation of the experience and less by the medical event or its objective severity. This is a really important factor here, that you know, two people in the same experience um, who have children who've gone through the same kind of bone marrow transplant uh, and maybe for the same underlying disorder may have very different responses uh, because our personal subjective experience is very important. And you know what? It's more important than the objective medical thing. I mean, we could say that a child has had you know, resistant acute lymphoblastic leukemia, multiple relapses, and now needs to go to a transplant. And does that inform us or tell us about how the level of traumatic experience the people may be experiencing, the family and the child? Not really. It's how they interpret it. Because some people are able, just because of who they are or their experiences, to kind of like go through these challenges. And it's kind of like the unsinkable Molly Brown. I mean, this is a story in a movie from times past. But the idea that, you know, whatever they encounter, uh, they might be on the Titanic, and yet they find a way to kind of like just keep going and to survive. Um, whereas other people might have a, you know, a similar kind of experience or even less severe, but it can be, feel like it's overwhelming to them. So this gives us a lot of hope for, you know, figuring out how we can help people deal with things and change their interpretation of what's happening. Um, PTSD, uh, so they may include symptoms of arousal, re-experiencing, and avoidance, or all of these things together. So arousal or hyper-arousal is like, you know, just, you know, going through your day, and then all of a sudden a thought pops into your mind about like, oh my gosh, I wonder if my child's blood count is okay today, and even though it's been okay. But that, that worry, just all of a sudden it pops in, and, and then sometimes it, 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 it takes over. So it's hard for us to manage that, and we're, worried, we're so worried, you know, I, I better call the doctor. You know, it just leads to a whole series of things because we're, we're so over-aroused by this, or we re-experience the trauma. It could be like, you know, having a dream where you, you know, just kind of like are, are going through it, or you hear a noise, or you see, you, pa you drive past a hospital. Maybe it's not even a hospital that you went to for your child's care. But seeing that can just trigger that re-experiencing phenomena where your body feels as though you are in the middle of that traumatic experience once again, even though you are not really there. I mean, you're not being threatened, but it feels that way. Uh, or avoidance. Um, you know, don't talk to me about anything. Uh, well, I want to you know, tell you that, you know, your aunt is going through a medical... You know, look, after what I've been through, I, I can't deal with it. I feel compassion for her, but please don't talk to me about it. So we, we try to avoid certain topics. We don't want to be around certain people that were connected to our experience. Sometimes when a child goes through their medical treatment and uh, if it's been significantly challenging, you know, some parents don't want to see those doctors anymore or nurses. Um, you know, look, we've just had enough and thank you very much for what you've done. We need to, you know, just not be there anymore. We don't want to come to the hospital for follow-up care. We want to go to a different hospital. So, you know, each person is a little different in how they do that. Um, reactions may vary in intensity, can be adaptive, or may become disruptive to functioning. So, again, here, too, from a psychological perspective, there are things that we can do to help this, you know, to help us recognize that we're experiencing these kinds of things, 
we are traumatized, we are having some difficulties, and we need to get some assistance with that or figure out how to do this. Uh, and at the bottom line, it's important to, can, to remember the majority of pediatric patients and their families are resilient and do well. I mean, that's something that we heard in the previous presentation on neuropsych. Um, you know, most kids do okay um, and really do well because children are resilient. So, you know, we're talking about a portion of people who have really difficult experiences. Um, everybody has some ups and downs and the chronic kinds of stress things, that's experienced by everybody. And everybody experiences some aspect, some element of trauma, but not necessarily to the degree that it prevents us from functioning. Uh, in studies that we have participated in, um, so looking at um, families facing childhood cancer, rates of PTSD are often higher in parents than in the child with cancer. Okay, so think about that for a moment. The child is the one that's going through this, and this is true for bone marrow transplant as well. The child is the one that's getting physically bombarded with all this, but parents experience it, uh, the distress at higher, in higher degrees, and mothers in a number of different studies that I've participated in directly are the ones who experience things the most. Well, when you stop and think about it, it's really not surprising because moms are the gatekeepers. They are the ones that are emotionally so closely connected to their children. And mothers are the ones that are trying to use, you know, the 360 vision, you know, looking all the way around over the horizon, what's going to happen, you know, tomorrow. Uh, if it's a rainy day, uh, do I, am I prepared? Is my child prepared to go to school with the right kind of clothing? Now, I'm a very involved father, and I think that we are seeing now, you know, fathers in general, more involved than they have been in the past. Certainly, I'm way more involved than my father was in the, in the raising of children. But I'm nowhere near the level where my wife is. So, for example, uh, you know, if she goes away for a couple of days, she's prepared everything. If I go away for a couple of days, I come back, you know, it's like, is everything fine? I mean, I didn't think about it. It doesn't mean I don't care, but we approach things differently. If you go to a pediatric oncology survivorship clinic, or you go into the into a daily the BMT clinic where you go back for your follow up care, the majority of parents that are there with their children are mothers. I mean, it's like we're talking, you know, at the ninety percent level. Okay, so we've got you know mothers are the ones that really need a lot of support because they are the ones that are primarily there. Uh, and our society, even though it's changing, still hasn't changed that much. Um, providing care for a child undergoing BMT is extremely stressful um, because you're worried and you're thinking about all of these things. 20 to 30 percent of mothers providing primary care to their children during BMT experience moderate to severe symptoms of depression or anxiety at the time of transplant. Okay, so we're talking about a third of mothers who are experiencing severe anxiety and depression. But every mother is feeling a lot. Um, but, you know, the important thing, again, is that not every person going through this is going to respond in the same way. And people are resilient, and distress does subside for most mothers. Uh, a follow-up study that was done at one and a half years after BMT, 50% of all mothers reported clini clinically significant levels of intrusive thoughts and worries. You know, so that's 50%. So, you know, if you are having some of these thoughts and worries and concerns, you know, you're, you're right in there with, you know, half, half of mothers do have those concerns. Um, and 20% at a year and a half are experiencing severe issues. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily connected to how difficult it is for the child. So the child may be doing okay, but we still have, you know, parents who might be in that 20% who are really having a very difficult time. So long-term traumatic stress responses are relatively common in moms, and we need to be aware of that. Um, in one of the studies that we have done where we intervened, this was with mothers at the time of a child's diagnosis with cancer. And uh, you see negative affectivity, and so stress level goes way up high. So what is coping? Let's kind of like move towards this in the final moments of my presentation here. Um, the process of managing our emotions and behavior when faced with a challenge. That's what coping is. You know, I can't cope. I mean, we use that kind of like generically. 
But coping is really, it's a process of managing our emotions and behavior. Okay, that's what we're really trying to do. Uh, and none of us are perfect, and we can't expect ourselves, and many times we do expect ourselves to be perfect. But, you know, this is, we're all human. Um, so the ongoing process of how we view the situation uh, as manageable or unmanageable, impossible or catastrophic. So some people say, oh, my gosh, you know, I can't get to, to pick up my child at 3 o'clock. Um, the world is over. Uh, you know, I, 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 this is, but, you know, okay, wait, take a deep breath, all right? So your child goes to school. You have friends that send their children to that same school. Perhaps you can call up, you know, one of the other parents and, you know, ask them if they could bring your child home with you if you're running late in clinic because you're there with the, with the child that needs the medical surveillance. It's not a catastrophe. You know, time out. Take a deep breath, okay? It's, ma it's a manageable issue, but it's only manageable if we can pull ourselves off of the ledge. And some of us go there more quickly than others. So in other words, our distress level rapidly shoots up when we're faced with a challenge, and we feel like it's, it's impossible. I can't do anything. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing is talking about how we can, you know, either you change the situation or you change the reaction, okay? So, and what we have learned is helping to, helping our, you know, the ways that we can change things. Normalizing traumatic responses and making meaning of the event. So let's talk. These, these are real interventions. So first, to accept the legitimacy and universality of your reactions to your child's experience and ongoing concerns. I mean, the first thing is to recognize that we're human. Okay, I'm really, you know, I'm having a hard time with this. You know what? But I don't think I'm the only one. Am I the only one? I don't know. So talk to people, you know, at your treating center. And you'll get, you know, information and reassurance and help to know that you're not an outlier. And that's where social support comes in or participating in a meeting such as this, where people can come together and learn that, hey, you know, I'm not alone. There are like hundreds of people that are going through this, and there are even way more than that. You know, identify the needs. Make sure your child and you have the help you need. You know, it might be medical, okay? So you're going to, you know, you have good physicians that you have confidence in, hopefully, and a whole medical team, psychological, academic, legal, support in the community. You know, we have to start thinking about what it is that we need. Create a frame of meaning around the traumatic experience. We get in trouble when we don't have boundaries in, our, in the way we approach the world. Think about, you know, when you were in maybe middle school and you had a binder and you had all these different subjects and you had, you know, and, and you had all these, you know, dividers for your different subjects in your notebook and you're running to get from one place, you take your binder out of the, you know, you're rushing to get it out of the locker and you're going to run to your, where you have to be next and the binder falls down and imagine that it opens up and the papers spill. Uh, how many people have ever had that experience? And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's overwhelming. And then you got to spend all this time and, you know, just gather up this stuff and, and, and then put it back together again. But so the dividers and help us to really keep track of things and to organize, just like you would organize different subjects in a big notebook to organize your day. Now, honey, okay, I'm sorry that your notebook fell down. You know what? You, we'll get, when you get home, we'll fix it. We'll put it back together. You're going to be okay. But I'll fail. I'll lose. I'll, you know. So we have to remind our children that, look, okay, things happen, and we can deal with them. So sometimes we have to create a frame of meaning for ourselves. Okay, what I'm going through right now is really challenging. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And um, you know, using the resources that we have that we'll talk about. Um, making linkages between past positive experiences and current thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. A trauma narrative. Okay, so the idea rather than this is a catastrophe, I don't know what's going to happen to my child, I don't know what's going to happen to my family, everything is lost, everything is hopeless, Time out, and I use the time out, the TO model or a stop sign, the idea of like, you know, stop your thoughts from just running all over the place. Uh, this is at the crux of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, an approach to kind of like get hold of ourselves, get hold of our thoughts and ideas. And so just like in a sporting event, I don't know if any of you are watching basketball playoffs or, you know, whatever it might be, March Man, you know, things about timeout and kind of like catching yourself and catching your thoughts 
so that they don't go all over the place. Um, this idea of making linkages, well, I've coped in the past. Rather than focus on, I've never done well in my life. Everything is terrible. Wait a minute. There are some things that are okay. You know, I did get through school. I did find a spouse. I did, you know, raise, raise children. Uh, I am a member of my church community. I do have friends. There are some things that I do okay. And then building on that and learning specific coping strategies to help with symptoms. So let's stop, talk for a moment. I'm going to be terrible, but I'm going to need five more minutes. So I will beg your indulgence with yeah, questions. But okay? Okay. Perfect. So I'll leave some time for questions. But stop, relax, and think. SRT. This is a paradigm that had, we've actually developed for working with children. And it's the same paradigm that we use for working with adults. It's pretty basic. It's a really cool idea. The stop. Stop negative thoughts. Okay, first you have to be aware that you're having negative thoughts. And sometimes these negative thoughts are in the background. We're not even aware of them. You're standing in line at the supermarket and you're thinking like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. I don't know what's going to happen with that. It's like, wait, what, what's, what am I thinking? So you have to learn how to talk to yourself, which is a process of amplifying those thoughts and feelings that are inside that you may not even be aware that you're having. People think that, well, only crazy people talk to ourselves. Well, it's not true. It's a very adaptive, healthy thing to do. And it's different than thinking, because thinking is just a passive kind of thing. You know, if you just, okay, think, think, think. You know, it's just like thoughts, zoom, zoom, zoom. But when we talk to ourselves, just like when we talk to somebody else, when we talk to one of our children, when we talk to a friend, we're, the process of talking is helping us organize all of these thoughts and feelings into kind of like, yeah, we're producing, and we can only say one thing at a time. But you know what? Thinking, we can probably only think one thing at a time, except we can switch very rapidly. So it's like, you know, the kid that's watching TV. I don't know if you have any family members like this. They love to keep switching channels. They can't stay focused on one thing. So that's what happens to our thoughts. Our thoughts can kind of like be switching around like multiple channels. But when we talk to ourselves, it doesn't have to be out loud, but you can talk quietly inside of your mind. Now, okay, I really have to get a grip on myself. This is not healthy. I need to take care, you know, take a moment and, you know, just kind of like relax. That's the second part of this paradigm. Relax and some specific ways to do that. Uh, how many people have done yoga? Um, okay, so you do breathing exercises that just kind of like help you to kind of like get focused. As you control your breathing, it's amazing. But the idea of just taking a couple of slow, deep breaths, focus your eyes on a spot, you know, just so that you're not visually like all over the place. Just take a moment. You can be standing in line. You could be at a red light. Take a moment. You keep your eyes open. You're aware of what's going on. But you inhale slowly, deeply. Hold the breath of air inside of you for a couple of seconds. Breathe it out slowly. <sighs> Repeat it a couple of times. That simple act of taking a couple of controlled breaths is very physiologically beneficial. I mean, our body appreciates it, our brain appreciates it, because you know what happens if your brain starts working in overtime? What do you think are the oxygen needs of your brain? If your brain, well, because the brain needs a lot of oxygen. It needs a lot of blood flow. That's why we, you know, our bodies are built to provide a lot of blood flow to our brain. But the more nervous we get, we tend to breathe more shallowly. You know, so, you know, like you just kind of like get to a point where you might even hyperventilate because, you know, the more nervous we are, we kind of like get constricted. And so the oxygen that we're bringing into our body is really minimal. So taking a couple of slow, deep breaths is an opportunity for you to kind of like, okay, get a little bit more oxygen into your brain and use that to be able to kind of like, instead of catastrophize and just go in this negative direction, everything is bad, hopeless, I can't do anything to wait a minute, time out. Okay, I, I just need a moment to think about this. And what I'm doing when I'm talking you know, to myself is what I encourage you to do. Now, some of you may do this already, and you just might not admit it to anybody. That's okay, too. You don't have to admit it to anybody. But just it's okay to do. It's healthy to talk to yourself. 
when you have a lot of things on your plate and what to do. And in fact, it's a great strategy to teach your children too when they start to get anxious or nervous. They just kind of like, slow down, take a deep breath, okay, ident- you know, just talk to yourself, what do you need to do, what's really important, what can be handled later, different ways of going through this. Um, in the relaxation, we also talk about you know, using imagery. So you may have a favorite place, and if we had more time, we could go through a demonstration. But, you know, using your mind, like being a favorite vacation, a favorite place that you've been to, that's a place that is kind of like anchored in your brain and has associations connected to it that are relaxing. And so, you know, sometimes it might not occur to you to kind of like, okay, take a deep breath and just take, I'm not saying, you know, take 10 minutes or two hours to relax. You don't have the time. But 30 seconds? You know, 30 seconds might be okay. Uh, Everybody might be able to grant themselves 30 seconds to be able to kind of like, okay, just calm yourself down. Okay, use that image, that place. All right, I think I can manage this. I think I can, I'm not quite sure exactly how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to try to slow down, break things down. The thinking and the stop, relax, and think is, what are the alternatives? You know, consider what else can I be doing instead of just going crazy at this moment in time Can I use problem-solving skills? So we've developed a paradigm called Bright Ideas. uh, And it's a system of problem-solving. And, you know, basically the bright, and here, you know, so the light bulb is a symbol of our project, Bright Ideas. The bright is like turning on a light bulb. Has anybody ever thought about, like, why is a light bulb associated with, like, thinking? Well, because it takes us out of the darkness. When we're nervous and upset and we don't know what to do, it's like we're stumbling around in the dark. Turn the light on, okay? Take a moment, turn the light on. Bright. So the idea is that we have to have a positive outlook. And people will say, well, you know, Dr. Katz, how can you talk about me having a positive outlook? I mean, I have a child with a serious health impairment, and I'm worried about that child's survival. So you tell me that I should kind of like take a deep breath or, you know, do something or think on the bright side. You know, I've got all this trauma and and difficult experiences to go through. And yes, I do understand, and we do appreciate that, and nobody's minimizing the challenges. But even within all of these challenges, we can still be optimistic that the best, we can try to do something that can help a little bit. Now, is that going to cure a child of underlying physical issues if we have a positive outlook? No, not by itself. But if we are a little bit more optimistic that, okay, I can do something to get to the school or to figure that out so I'm, I don't you know, just worry about my child incessantly, I can do small things that make a difference. And so that's the the beginning of a bright idea is like starting with a positive expectation. Okay, I can do something. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be able to do or what I'll come up with, but I'm going to try to take a deep breath and I'm going to try to do something because you know what? I am resourceful. I can survive. I can do things that can help. Uh, In our ideas, every one of these letters stands for another step in this process. But the idea is that you know, when you were dealing with problems, what, what problem are we dealing with? You know, okay, I, I can't get my child from school. Well, okay, so it's a specific problem. So it's not that you're a failure with everything, and you're not a failure with this. You're stuck in clinic for a medical appointment, and your child needs to be picked up, another child needs to be picked up at school. So, okay, here's a problem. Let's, you know, instead of like freaking out, which is like losing the dividers in the notebook, the boundaries go away and we, the freak out travels all over our brain and our entire brain gets caught up in it. So instead we want to kind of like, okay, let's try to be specific, identify the problem, define the problem, you know, who, what, when, where, all right, my child's at school, who can pick him up? How can I get this? Who can, uh, okay, slow down. I know there are a few people. Let me consider this. Okay. So Define your options, pick one, you know, evaluate the options, try the best one. The A in ideas is act on it, actually do it. And then the S is see what happens. So this is a process, an iterative process where we're building. I'd like to kind of like switch for a moment and talk a little bit about mindfulness. So I just want to make sure we leave at least 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Okay. So mindfulness is a process, a psychological quality that involves bringing one's complete attention to the present experience on a moment-to-moment, non-judgmental basis. So mindfulness-based stress reduction. This is a new 
technology that is everything is related everything is connected but the idea of like learning how to be mindful and how to calm yourself down rather than getting worked up so here is kind of like just uh you know a visual stand in an open space where mindfulness reveals and heals this does not take the place of having to deal with real world problems but this is trying to find ways that you can have some peace within that uh, co-constructing a trauma narrative the idea of like the story of what happened you know like people come home from clinic where you've brought your child and maybe you're dealing with some kind of a complication and then you get on the phone and you tell grandma about what happened and then the, the, the phone rings again and now you're reviewing it with aunt meanwhile your children are, are soaking all this stuff in and you're talking about oh I can't believe it I mean the doctors don't know what they're doing and we had all this stuff it's like, you know, be mindful about, you know, the people that are around you and you're kind of like creating an environment that can be stressful, which may not be helpful for the other members of your family. And it may not be helpful for you either. Um, and sometimes people pull from that. You know, they, they want to hear the bad stuff. They want to hear the, the traumatic stuff. You know, if it's kind of like if you're OK, they're not really spending much time with you. I mean, it sounds a little bit upside down and sometimes it can be. And that's where we need to learn ways to kind of like bring this together. Um, survivors. So our particular program runs a survivorship program, uh, an event on an annual basis. Uh, and we have a scholarship program and we do things to kind of like acknowledge. And this is part of the narrative. Yes, you have been through a really difficult experience, but you know what? You have learned things from this. That's benefit finding that even in the face of something really difficult and something really hard, that you have been through it and you have gained from it. And I guarantee you, 90% of these kids, when they're writing their essays for college, they're writing about the experiences that they have gone through and what they have learned. And I want to go to medical school. I want to be a nurse. I want to, whatever it is that they want to do. My experience has informed me in a positive way, as opposed to my experience has just completely derailed my life. And unfortunately, there are some young people who do feel that way, and that's where we do need special assistance for them or for their parents. And with that, I will stop and entertain questions. My son, uh, you know a little bit about now, uh, we did some cognitive behavioral therapy um, about a year ago. And I don't know if it was the therapist or if it was just that he could not buy into it. Um, she used terms like brain farts that he, you know, the thoughts that go into your head, kind of what you were talking about. And I don't know if it's just because he's been through so much and he understands his history and he's very science-based now because of it. Um, that he's not, so I'm just wondering how, I know this is a whole um, type of therapy, but also how can I get a teenager that's a little bit resistant to it to maybe buy into that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really important question because there can be all kinds of interventions and things that are out there, but how do we get kids to them? How do we get parents to them? How do we get ourselves to, you know, to buy into them? And and here, the you know, I do think that the the match between the provider, the caregiver, and the patient client is really important. And so, yeah, looking at the chemistry and what is it about, you know, your particular child strengths and, you know, the kinds of things that he likes and can something be presented through that paradigm. Uh, when I work clinically, I think, you know, all of us that are clinicians, you know, are thinking about that that we've got to match, you know, our strategies and our approach to the individual child or, you know, parent that, that comes in for services, as opposed to, this is the way I do things. So, you know, if you want to take advantage of it, fine. If not, next. Uh, yeah, I'm not really going to invest in this unless, you know, you feel. And, and so, you know, you'd look for, uh, I would suggest, you know, looking for somebody who can connect. And if your child really likes science, I mean, this stuff is great. And all the brain science that is evolving now, uh, I mean, I, that's a big part of what I do in my personal practice is, 
is really trying to you know, engage kids and do it in a way, whether it's using play for younger children or even older children, sometimes you know, engaging them with uh, you know, software or uh, computer games or things that they're aware of. And uh, there are a lot of interesting things that are being developed and evolving and just how they help to kind of like, you know, if you can understand how this game is working, you can, and we can start to kind of like draw some parallels to how your mind is working, you know, so that then, you know, just like you, you wouldn't keep doing the same ineffective strategy if you're playing a game and you're trying to get to the goal. I mean, okay, you tried it one, oh, that didn't work, try something else, you know, but sometimes in life, it's not that clear. So we just keep doing the same thing, the same thing over and over again. No, it's not helping. You're not helping. Nobody's helping. So how can we kind of like create that partnership to move forward? But, but it is important. And, you know, if it hasn't worked, that doesn't mean that it cannot work. Anyone else? Hello. Um, uh, my son has, he's five, he has dyskeratosis congenita. And um, I've, I've obviously, being his mother, I have struggled myself with even the thought of him not surviving at some point. Uh, you know, obviously from the very first moment of diagnosis and before. Um, I, he's also very scientifically minded uh, for, throughout his experience. He's really into that. And I've taken a very open and honest approach with him. Um, I, can, I find I can explain things to him, you know, the, cir the cycle, the circle of life. And he, get, he seems to get it at an age-appropriate level. Um, because of his condition, uh, I and he has a younger sibling, I was wondering if you have any um, suggestions or uh, could point me in the right direction towards how to speak to him um, without, you know, without telling him, you know, that, that you could could pass away, you know, well, how appropriately. Is, how is he doing right now? He's, he's great. Uh, Considering everything, he's very healthy right now, actually. Um, what happens to me inside my head is um, I know that things could be different, and I don't even have any idea what that could be. I feel out of control of that. Um, and I have struggles my, personally with um, you know, accepting the circle of life, actually. Um, but... I want to approach it with him and also with my younger son in a way that, you know, if they find themselves facing that loss um, sooner rather than later, uh, be it in 10 years or 20 years, but it could be earlier um, then. And, and I would like some suggestions if you have them on how to really prepare as much as possible their, his their mental state with acceptance and it being okay, okay. Um, instead of fear. Like I, I grew up fearing and still to this day fear it and I don't want it to be a fearful thing as much as possible. Um, and in, in a more of not a faithful way but more of a medical way um, because I can look at it in a faithful way of mm -hmm. course uh, in other paths but medically he's very interested in all of that and I think that's a very good approach for him. Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, it, uh, it's a really profound and important question, and I thank you for raising it. You know, so we're talking about some real basic issues here, and that is that, okay, so we don't know what the future holds. Uh, and again, in my lifetime, you know, I have seen things, I've seen diagnoses and illnesses that were considered to be hopeless to not be hopeless. Uh, and... I really believe that we have to take that bright ideas, you know, that idea of kind of like the optimism, not Pollyannish, not to pretend. We don't, you know, because pretending is not helpful. And children see through that immediately. So they need to understand that, you know, look, we, you know, you do have some of these medical issues. We're very concerned about you. You need to go through these treatments. You need to see these doctors. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to help promote life and living. 
You know, so here's the real truth about life. Life is a terminal disease. Life is a terminal condition. None of us get out of it alive, right? So to be born is to focus. One could just say, like, well, this is all meaningless because we're all going to die anyway. So whatever, you know, you don't have to contribute or work very hard and be a part of society, be productive, because who cares? It's going to be over anyway. Well, obviously, society could not have continued and our own personal philosophies of life, whether they're religious, humanistic, however, people kind of like look at that. Life has meaning. We create the meaning. We create the meaning. And it's not based on the number of years that a person lives. I'm sure all of us know people who are elderly, who are wonderful and kind and, and just making such a great contribution in their later years. And some people, maybe not even that old, but they're crotchety. I mean, they're just not nice people. They're not positive people. They're always looking at the negative side of life. And, uh, you know, and so here we have, you know, children who are open to the experiences and they are way more resilient than we are as adults. They're physically more resilient. Has anybody ever wondered, like, why is the survivorship for children with serious illnesses so much higher than it is for adults? Well, one of the things that we do believe is because they are physically more resilient, right? A little kid falls down and gets back up. Well, as we get older and we fall down, it's harder to get back up. Uh, but kids, you know, they can bounce. And emotionally, they can go up and down and they are capable of you know, having a bad moment and, oh, you know, crying so hysterically, the world is over, and then it's next minute, I'm, I'm ready to go outside and play. Now, I've seen and working with children who are at the end of life, and I think it's very important to differentiate. You know, if you have a child with a life-threatening illness, that does not, that child, you know, is living with a potential life-threatening illness, and, and you as parents or caregivers are living with that reality. And yes, your understanding of it is going to be very different than the child's. And that's legitimate, and it should be that way, because we don't expect that a five-year-old child is going to be thinking about all these different options. But you know what? A five-year-old doesn't necessarily fear anything. They're picking it up from us. And so, of course, it's natural that as a parent, and you know that your child has, you know, people are telling you statistics, they're telling you numbers, they're telling you this, they're telling you that, and it's kind of like making your head swim. But when it comes down to it, you know, taking things, you know, like one day at a time, if your child is, on, is in a particular situation where they are at the end of life, which means literally, you know, within a few weeks of the end of their life, and we know that that's happening and that that's coming, then we would be working with that child in one particular way and with the family. But if the child is basically doing okay and doing what he or she, or she needs to do, now it's important that you know we don't want to lie to children. At the same time, we do have to understand that we don't have to bombard them and overwhelm them with information that's not relevant. I mean, the child needs to go to school, have fun and play. He's medically able to do that. He needs to have a sense of his future. The tomorrow I'll be able to play, and the day after that I'll be able to play. And yeah, you know, just as you would present children on a regular basis, you know, without if you didn't have this significant experience hanging over your head, you know, we all introduce children to the end of life and to death and if somebody that they know passes away and that becomes a natural part or they're going to clinic or in a medical environment and they see and they meet and they interact with other children, they need to understand that, yeah, that, well, did that child have the same thing that I did? Um, perhaps, you know, yes or no. Uh, and if the child did have the same thing, then, well, does that mean it's going to happen to me? Well, your doctors and all of us are doing everything we can, which is not a lie. We're doing everything we can to help you continue to be healthy. So, right, that we're not lying. We're not saying we're going to cure you 100% guarantee. Here it is. You know, it's never going to happen to you. We don't know, but we don't have to focus on that. We can focus on we are doing everything we can to help healthy living continue and to do the best that we can. And then you're going to adjust how you communicate as reality changes or not. Um, but if you prepare a child to die, 
and the child has 10 or 15 years or 20 years or 100 years. How many years do you have? How many years do I have? I don't know. I mean, so we all live with this uncertainty. The reality is that our driving home, for those of us who've commuted here, uh, you know, we're facing more danger on the freeways and driving, but we block that out of our mind, right? Because like, okay, those are statistics, but I don't have to pay attention to that, that really the likelihood is much higher that something tragic can happen to me going home than to perhaps your child in the next 24 hours because I'm going to be on the freeway a lot. Um, but we don't think about that. So that's a normal coping response, and it's not lying. Uh, we know we're not lying to our ourselves. What we are doing is we're creating a narrative. We're creating a story. We're creating a structure for ourselves to be able to move forward. And for those people who do practice uh, uh, faith, um, religious practices, um, I personally am very involved in that pursuit. And for me, you know, it doesn't provide all the answers, but I, I use my faith to kind of like help myself be able to continue moving forward. Other people can use other things. Um, and it's very interesting that, you know, some people who, like are atheists, well, I don't believe in God, so I don't believe in, you know, any magic. There's not going to be any, you know, there's going to be a scientific answer to this or a scientific answer, or there won't be. Well, what is science? Science is belief, friends. I mean, I'm involved in basic science, and I can tell you that, yes, somebody believes in something, and they find some evidence for it, uh, and then they have to work really hard, and they're not always getting reinforced for that hard work. Uh, and there are many scientific breakthroughs that come about when people have told them, once other scientists have said, your ideas stink. And you know what? Forget it. It's not going to work. And people stick with it. And so what keeps them sticking with it? I mean, it's not necessarily scientific. The scientific thing to do would be, okay, give up. I tried. It, the, the experiment didn't work out. So then I should just stop. No, you know, there's a lot of faith that goes into healthcare, whether we identify in that way or not. But as we focus on our daily living, it really becomes important for us to keep track of what is important. And it's being able to experience joy and quality of life in every single day and keeping ourselves in a positive place. So that means learning to compartmentalize the fears and the worries that you have as a parent. Uh, because if you allow it to be all over at all times, it will overwhelm you. And as you find a place to put it, you can visit it, you can visit those thoughts, but they don't have to run your life. Uh, and then, okay, I visited you for five minutes today and I'm done with you for the rest of today. Uh, and that's a, a procedure that can be done. And uh, I do thank all of you we're out of time, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy.